I invite the reader to examine this photograph of Cecil Rhodes taken at midlife. Look at the sanctimonious self-seriousness expressed in clenched jaws, the irregular, roughly oval-shaped face, the heavily wrinkled, flinty blue eyes, the small mouth, the gray hair flecked with white that Rhodes, like Clinton after him, possessed as distinguishing facial features at midlife. As surely as they grow big watermelons in Arkansas, and cousins copulate with cousins there, Cecil Rhodes looked like Bill Clinton with a mustache. Close, but no cigar, you say? If you doubt this, then I invite you to find another human genome to be part of. End quote. Well, I'll let you make of that article what you will. Certainly, I think that the evidence there presented for Clinton's uh, direct descendants from Cecil Rhodes is flimsy at best and not something that I would necessarily hang my hat on. But the point, the general point of the article that there is much doubt and confusion about Clinton's actual paternity and lineage is, I think, well made, well established. And given the uh, very wide number of different competing theories there, at the very least, we can take it for granted that there is some mystery about where Clinton really comes from. Something that I think a lot of people would agree is a pretty important thing for a presidential candidate. The person in the highest office, in the, uh, the most important office in the world, would have uh, pretty well established by the time he comes into office. But like we've seen with Obama, I suppose that is no longer really taken uh, seriously. And uh, there have been other theories floated around about Clinton's lineage, uh, ones that have not been covered in that article even, including one that uh, posits that, in fact, they were actually, Clinton was actually descended from a Rothschild. And this one is equally, in fact, perhaps even more so lacking in terms of supporting evidence. And the only evidence that I've been able to track down online is the claim supposedly given off the record to some unnamed journalist by some supposed and unnamed member of the Rothschild family that he or she had seen Clinton at various family functions throughout the years. Again, I would take that for what it's worth, which is practically nothing, but... At any rate, it is interesting to see the connections between Clinton and some of these insider groups, including the uh, the Rhodes Roundtable and the Rothschilds, who have been open supporters of Clinton and his uh, his political agenda and his wife's political agenda for many years. More on which shortly. But let's just take a look at another interesting and suppressed aspect of the Clinton's past. This time, again, coming from TheForbiddenKnowledge.com, and this time from an article called Student Bill Clinton Spied on Americans Abroad for the CIA. A new book alleges that Bill Clinton spent his Oxford days monitoring anti-Vietnam war activists for the CIA. Ambrose Evans Pritchards reports from Washington. Quote, When Bill Clinton ran for the U.S. presidency four years ago, Republicans tried to prove that, as a student, he burnt the stars and stripes in protest at the Vietnam War. Now, Dr. Roger Morris, author of an astonishing new book called Partners in Power, claims that in the late 1960s, Mr. Clinton worked as a source for the Central Intelligence Agency. So was the young Clinton a patriot or just an opportunist? He was certainly no dangerous radical. No attack by his reactionary opponents would be more undeserved than the charge that young Bill Clinton was radical, concludes Morris. According to the book, the bearded, disheveled Rhodes scholar was recruited by the CIA whilst at Oxford, along with several other um, young Americans with political aspirations, to keep tabs on fellow students involved in protest activities against the Vietnam War. Morris says that the young Clinton indulged in some low-level spying in Norway in 1969, visiting the Oslo Peace Institute and submitting a CIA informant's report on American peace activists who had taken refuge in Scandinavia to avoid the draft. An officer in the CIA station in Stockholm confirmed that, said Morris. The Washington establishment would like to dismiss this troubling book as the work of a fevered conspiracy theorist, but Morris is no lightweight. But Morris is no lightweight. He worked at the White House in both the Johnson and Nixon administrations, resigning from the National Security Council in 1970 in protest over the U.S. invasion of Cambodia. He went on to become an acclaimed biographer of Richard Nixon. Even Hillary Clinton was a cold warrior of sorts. Described in Morris's book as a closet Contra supporter, she quietly aided Contra fundraising in Little Rock. She also used her influence in U.S. liberal circles to undercut the legitimacy of peace activists and pro-Sandinista church groups opposed to President Reagan's policies in Central America. The point is not that Bill and Hillary Clinton are right-wingers in disguise, although Morris demolishes the pretense that they were progressive reformers in Arkansas. It is that they have no conviction no ideology, no guiding purpose. Driven by raw ambition, 
they will make any compromi compromise necessary to advance their interests. End quote. Well, if that isn't a nice summary of our opening points in today's episode, I'm not sure what is. Although I still do think that they do have at least one genuine ideological commitment, and that is their commitment to globalism. So let's circle back for a moment. Although I do not think that there's any reason for actually believing the claims that, that are unsourced and unnamed and un unverified that Clinton is descended from the Rothschilds and actually a part of that family, it is undeniable and indisputable that the Rothschilds have been very much in the Clinton's political corner for a long time. Now to the political story that everybody has been buzzing about today. The prominent Hillary Clinton fundraiser and big-time Democrat who came out for John McCain. And it's not just that she is switching sides. It's what she says about Barack Obama. She calls him elitist. That word, a bit surprising for someone who's married to a billionaire. So let's ask her about it. Joining me live now, Lady Lynn Forrester de Rothschild. Lady de Rothschild, is it okay if I call you Lynn? Please call me Lynn Campbell. I absolutely will. So you, you've got to understand how ridiculous this seems to a lot of people. You're a Rothschild. You're married to a billionaire. You were a millionaire before you married him. You're a jet setter. You live between New York and London. Um, and yet you're calling Barack Obama an elitist. Are you not a member of the elite? I thank Oxford for hosting us. And I'd like to thank uh, Jacob Rothschild and the Rothschild Foundation for their role in this. And thank Jacob in particular for inviting me to participate. Now, the question might be raised, what is the point of raising all of this information right now? After all, the Clinton's political moment seems to have passed for the most part, most part, specifically Bill's political moment. So what is the point of dredging up this history at this point? Well, first of all, it is important to have an accurate portrayal of the history so that we can accurately form an understanding of the Clinton's real political legacy, not that phony varnished version that's being sold to the public right now and which, to the surprise of Fareed Zakaria and other globalist insiders, is making, in retrospect, a very uh, venerated figure of President Clinton and uh, makes the mindless hordes at the Democratic National Convention cheer at his every speech and his every word as if it were some jo golden jewels from heaven. But also, I think it is important because there is still political juice left in the Clinton's rocket, and there is still the ever-present possibility that Hillary will make a run for president in 2016 or, or somewhere down the road, and that chance is fading, to be sure, but it is still there, and she is still, well, I guess uh, getting her political bona fides worked up with her... Tre uh, treasure, uh, sorry, Secretary of State position. So it is important to keep tabs on this and to really understand what the Clinton's political body count, both literal and metaphorical, really is so that people will be better served by the, the, that true information, better able to defend themselves against any, uh, any veneration that comes out about the Clintons. And hopefully this type of message will be spread far and wide and people will come to a better understanding of this true suppressed history. And just as one example of the ways that the Clintons are still very much involved in what's happening right now, of course, there's not only Hillary's work spreading fear and, uh, and dread around the world and exporting America's war on terror uh, still in the name of the, uh, the Al-Qaeda boogeyman or the Coney boogeyman or whatever boogeyman is coming down the line. But also there's the small thing about uh, Bill Clinton and his work at the uh, Clinton Global Initiative and the Clinton Foundation. And there have been some interesting revelations that have come out about that in recent years as well, including the fact that Clinton Foundation's great work helping Haiti, oh, it's just such a beautiful thing, all of this donations and money that they're giving to these the, the, the charitable cause of helping out the Haitians. Well, it just so happens that the first project that the Clinton Foundation worked on was to give the Haitians toxic FEMA camp trailers. Former President Bill Clinton has played a major role in relief efforts, serving as the U.N. Special Envoy to Haiti and as co-chair of the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission. Through his Clinton Foundation, the former president has helped fund a number of projects in Haiti. Well, a new investigative report from The Nation magazine takes a critical look at the Clinton Foundation's first recovery commission project in post-earthquake Haiti, the construction of shelters in the city of Laogan. President Clinton first announced the project in a video on his foundation's website. Many of you have expressed your interest in the progress being made in Haiti as the nation continues to recover from the earthquake. 
I wanted to give you just a quick update of some of our ongoing efforts to help the people build back better. The recent cholera outbreak serves as a stark reminder of the urgency we face to address the strengthened reconstruction efforts in Haiti. After the outbreak, my foundation responded, allocating a million dollars to the government so that we could move supplies down there in a hurry. In addition to the health outbreaks, the hurricane season remains a threat, especially to those still living in camps. My foundation has contributed a million dollars there to the construction of emergency storm shelters in Leogon. But according to a new expose in The Nation magazine, the shelters turned out to be a series of trailers beset with problems, including mold, shoddy construction, in one case, worrying levels of formaldehyde. The trailers are also built by the same company, Clayton Homes, that's currently being sued in the U.S. for providing formaldehyde-laced trailers to displace residents after Hurricane Katrina. Yes, make no doubt about it, the Clintons are still very much at the heart of this political beast, and they still very much have the chance and the opportunity to shape the world that we're living in. So we do have to expose them for what they are, and that is a very, very dark and bleak history, but it can be documented, and there's a lot to go through. So, of course, there are voluminous amounts of notes in today's episode to all sorts of documents and documentaries that I highly recommend people take a look at for more information on these subjects and start going down that rabbit hole. But I certainly hope that this information is valuable for you in helping to start that process of opening up the book on the Clintons' real political legacy. Once again, if you do find this independent alternative media helpful, it is brought to you by you, so I do genuinely appreciate all the subscribers and people who purchase the DVDs out there. Just once again reminding you that the latest wor uh, DVD, The Last Word, is available for purchase now through CorbettReport.com, and I do rely on your support. So thank you for that. Once again, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again next week. That's it, the honey, honey, just lie. Like me, I'm a guy, got it in your eyes. You gotta, you gotta dress with a lot of stuff on it. Put it in the wall, show them spin. Prosecutors looking at me, glancing the kid. And they're thinking that I'm a pig. Slippery like a squid, like a cigar right from Cubic Bar. But don't bite it, and most of all, keep it quiet. In the Oval Office for a sexual soiree. I make you all sticky, Hillary hates foreplay. Yo, don't you dare ask me how I've been it. Ha <laughs> ha. Big Willie Styles all in it. Getting shaky with it. <laughs> uh, what?